go on back. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, I'm glad you guys are able to join us this morning. So, thank you for the uh, R2D2 uh, popcorn popper. I know. Um, honestly, I, so I can say this with um, minimum of like 99.9% .9 honesty. Uh, there is not a single church that I would rather be at than where I am now. Um, you guys have been incredibly uh, gracious. You have been incredibly welcoming. Uh, and I honestly could not be more proud of, of the church. Um, the point one percent chance has to do with constantly being teased about uh, buying Fords. Can't be a crap in your whole life. Yeah. I mean, you know, it, nobody's perfect, right? So, like, as a church, we're close. But I still get heckled a little bit too much for buying boards and uh, you know martial arts and being in the city and stuff like that. Um, if you notice, I've been wearing a lot more flannels than I ever did when I lived in the city. So we're working on it. Uh, I officially own a camo shirt, right? Got that last year. Uh, we're back into camo season, so now I just need to get a pair of overalls. Um, you know, and wear those to, to preach in. Um, with some muck boots, like the real muck boots, you know, like, I, think, I gotta get the real ones. Um, ever since I moved to Missouri, it's like, everybody's always talking about muck boots, and I didn't even know what that was. I didn't even know that that was like, I didn't know that that was even the name of the brand. They were like, muck boots, and I was like, what's a muck boot? And they were like, you don't know what muck boots are? And I'm like, no, that's why I'm asking. And they're like, you know, like rubber boots, you know, like boots that you would, you know, get wet, get muddy, and I'm like, we don't have those in the city. We we go around and walk around with like bags on our shoes to make sure that they don't get money and dirty, you know? Like, but we're adjusting. Uh, and so the past year, roughly, has been uh, an adjustment. Um, <laughs> it's been an adjustment for sure. Um, but I have uh, enjoyed the, the time that I've got to stay with you uh, thus far. So it was pointed out uh, to me that the passage that we're going to be looking at today, uh, we, which for the record, I pointed out, I did already know this beforehand. It was like, oh man, I hope nobody else knows this, <laughs> but someone did. So um, a, a few people did. So I preached this exact same passage uh, a little bit about 364 days ago, yeah. and for the record, uh, the passage was relevant then, uh, and it is still relevant today. So here's what happened to kind of explain uh, why it seems ill-prepared that I'm preaching the exact same passage. Last year, around uh, this time, uh, if I'm not mistaken, October 11th, right? Uh, October 11th. Last year, I preached uh, a very similar sermon to what we will get today uh, on the exact same passage. Now, a year ago, in 2020, when I preached this passage, it was the day after a tragic motorcycle accident. Uh, I remember it very vividly. Uh, I walked in that Sunday morning, and... People were in tears. There was a lot of sadness. Uh, and I was completely clueless and had no idea uh, what was going on. And so just kind of on the fly, I decided to preach this passage. We're going to be looking at uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, if you want to go ahead and turn there. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. It is meant to be an encouragement to the, to the church at Thessalonica. 
It is meant to serve the purpose of explaining to Paul's audience what happens uh, in the resurrection. It is meant to offer peace and encouragement to those who are grieving. And so uh, today, I would like to look at what Paul has to say to the church at Thessalonica. But first, I have to ask, uh, have any of you guys been caught unprepared? <laughs> Uh, or possibly uninformed, caught by surprise, uh, all different kinds of synonyms for the exact same thing of being a deer in a head bite. Um, so when I was in school, uh, for me, when I was like really young, back when they still did this, I don't even know if you could do this. Probably not, I don't know. Uh, but there were like pop quizzes. Right, so like you would walk into school and you'd be minding your own business, you'd be looking forward to the rest of your day, you think that school is going to go really well, you're going to hang out with your friends, you walk in and they're like, here you go, here's a math quiz, good luck, and it's like, wait a second, why, like why is there a math quiz, and they're like, it's a pop quiz, like that explains why there's a quiz, um, like that's not what I asked, I wasn't asking what kind of quiz, I was asking why are we taking a quiz right now. Um, and so that was kind of then. Much more recently, um, this past Thursday, I substitute teach for taught teach taught. I substitute. <laughs> Time to get me out of the school. Okay? <laughs> this is why I'm just a substitute. Funny enough, next month I'm substitute teaching for uh, language arts. So that will look great. Um, <laughs> Brooke teaches oh, fourth grade. Boy. You can go a few days and learn some stuff. Thank you. <laughs> I might. I might have to. I'll um, all the pointers you need. Yeah. Clearly, I need work in English. Uh, so I substitute taught for art. Uh, so I did that Wednesday and Thursday. I was specifically told on Wednesday, don't let them uh, get too much paper because you'll be out of paper. Uh, if you continue to just let them draw and draw and draw and draw, and I was like, what does she know? Um, so you're out of paper. So close. Um, Wednesday, I had roughly like 10 sheets of paper, which is not a whole lot to last for three or four classes of, you know, almost 20 kids. Again, I'm just a substitute teacher, so math is also not my thing. Uh, but if you have 10 pieces of paper and like 40 kids, I'm no mathematician. But when I did substitute for Brooke, we did have to learn which number is bigger than the other. 40 is a little bit bigger than 10. Um, so I realized that at the end of the day, and I was like, you know, I'm going to be a good substitute teacher. I'm going to bring the kids paper. Totally forgot to bring the kids paper. Uh, I forgot to buy the paper at least uh, the day before. So it's like 5.30 in the morning when I wake up to get ready for the day on Thursday. And I'm like, Dollar General, close until 8. That's not going to work because I'll be already at the school. Uh, Walmart, open at 6. Awesome. Now I get to drive to Owensville at like 5.30 in the morning. Uh, because like i got to get back on time too. So it's like... It was stressful, uh, very unprepared, and when you're caught in those like really unprepared situations, there's a lot of ill feeling, right? Like typically the word peace does not come into description when you're caught in these kind of what's going on moments. You're not like, oh man, uh, I forgot to buy paper for the kids, and you know my entire three or four hours of elementary teaching kind of banks on having enough paper, you're not thinking like, everything's going to work out. I'm fine. This is peaceful. I'll sit down on the front porch, maybe have a cup of coffee or two or three. I got plenty of time. It's like, all right, no time, shower, that's not taking long, uh, no cup of coffee, maybe on the way back if I have time, I'm running to Walmart, 
and everything is very hectic and uh, very non-peaceful. Uh, and that tends to be the way that things go. That was the way things went when I had pop quizzes, because it was like, I don't know what's going to be on here, uh, and my whole life is pretty much making on that I do well on these pop quizzes, because it seems like they happen once a week, and my grade is pretty much based on these. And it can be very hectic and throw people off. And so Paul has some encouragement, and he seeks to prepare, sort of like what the substitute tried to do for me, he seeks to prepare his audience for what they can expect and what needs to happen when it relates to the coming of the Lord and the end times. So we're going to start in verse 13. It says this. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, concerning those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve like the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, in the same way through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. And so here what Paul is uh, telling his audience is that I don't want you to be uninformed. We do not want you to be afraid. We don't want this to be a surprise to you. We want you to be encouraged. We want you to know that even though you have lost people, even though some of your friends and your family have been killed for their faith, even though uh, some of them have just died of old age, even though some of them have passed away due to natural uh, disasters, even though all of these situations are coming and claiming the lives of the ones that you love, we want you to be informed that those who are dead in Christ will be reunited with him. And because of this, he says, we do not want you to grieve like the rest who have no hope. Now, I want to kind of make this clear. This is not like a, if you cry because somebody who has passed away, uh, if you start to cry, it's not like, you know, you are automatically hopeless and you know, you're going to burn in hell because you decided to cry at a funeral. That's not what this is saying. This is not like a, uh, th this is not like a, this is the way it has to be. This is not, do not grieve at all. This is, it is okay to have some grief, but we do not grieve the same way that others do. That those who feel as if there is no hope, that they have lost their person forever, we do not grieve the same way. We have a hope of a brighter future and of a resurrection. And that's what Paul is trying to let his audience know. That we have a hope of being reunited. And so this brings us to our first point for the sermon. If we can go ahead and put that up. It's this. It's that the grief of the godly should look different from the grief of the worldly. In today's uh, present day and age, there is a big shift. We've kind of been seeing this shift take place. Uh, roughly since about the 1700s uh, is primarily when this kind of kicked off. It's this age of enlightenment, right? And so the age of enlightenment is this time period where uh, scientific research and scientific study started to uh, take precedence over everything else that was going on around the world. So a lot of people who were hardcore believers, hardcore Christians, started to see uh, this science kind of take over their faith. And so uh, the United States and many of the more Western civilizations, uh, we are known to be in this day and age kind of considered uh, post-Christian. That's kind of the world that we live in, especially in Western traditions, is uh, post-Christian. So basically everything that we believe in the Bible that had a time and that had a place, but that time and place, it's gone and it's been kind of superseded by science, right? So uh, we no longer believe in the creation uh, account. We now believe in evolution. 
and we no longer believe that there is a God that uh, oversees everything, and we are just kind of our own autonomous person. And there is no longer a resurrection, but simply when we die, uh, we just go in the ground, we become fertilizer for the trees, and that is it. That is the end of life. And so uh, we are kind of living in this world where this is becoming a predominant belief, and we are told by Paul that we are not to grieve the way that those people do. They don't believe in a resurrection. They don't believe in being reunited with Christ. And so the way that they grieve looks very different. Because when they see their loved one decease, they will never see them again. And that brings about a very different kind of grief than those who believe in a resurrection. And so that is the first thing that Paul is calling us to observe is that the way we grieve needs to look different from the way of the world. Now, let's pick up uh, in verse 18. Paul says this. For we say this to you by a word from the Lord. We who are still alive at the Lord's coming will certainly not perceive those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout with the archangel's voice, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will raise first. And so, um, what Paul is kind of explaining here is sort of the pattern of the resurrection. Right, so uh, Christ is going to come back, and he's coming with a trumpet and a, a shout, and those who were dead in Christ first are going to rise first. They are going to rise first. And so this brings us to the next point, and it's this. This is sort of the encouragement that Paul sets to lay out for his entire audience, is that those in Christ are going to be reunited with him. That those who are dead in Christ, they will rise first. They will be reunited with Christ first. And we are going to find out in the next couple of verses what happens to those who are still living. Those who are in the church, those who are uh, believers in Christ. What is going to happen to those who are still living if the dead in Christ rise first? And it says this, uh, verse 17. It says, then we who are still alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. And so Paul explains that those who are in Christ and still living at a time of his return... They will be reunited. They will be lifted up to be with the Lord. So there is this hope that those who are both dead and those who are alive will be reunited together and reunited with Christ if they are in Christ. And so Paul's final words of this chapter is that they are to encourage one another. And the calling for us is the same. If we can go ahead and go to that next slide. We, as a body of believers, are called to encourage each other with these same words. We still live on earth, right? Yes? Yeah. Yes, okay. I figured, I thought I might get more of those. Like, I don't know. Maybe, to be fair, maybe some of you, like, right now, as I've been speaking for a while, like, you're currently kind of not on earth. <laughs> so to speak, right? Like, I get it. I understand. I've started substitute teaching. Luckily, I've been doing art, so they always care about what I have to say right now. 
Um, but I also have to do math and stuff like that at some point. I understand, and I've also been there. I, I know what it's like to not be on Earth and kind of be somewhere else. Um, but for the rest of us who are all on Earth, uh, we are called to encourage each other because while we are still in a physical Earth, we still have people who go through deaths in their life. There are still people who lose the people that they love. We still have that because we are still currently living in the world. And so we are called as Christians to encourage each other. So it is, it is not like a, hey, don't cry because they're in a better place. It is a, hey, we have hope. We have the possibility of being reunited. This is not a time to lose all hope that you will never see them again. There is hope. And we are called to encourage each other with that. And uh, as a sneak peek into next week, we'll be looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And uh, Paul is going to continue to elaborate on the coming of the Lord. And one of the things that he says that I kind of want to start to end with is that Paul explains that Jesus is going to come like a thief in the night. Now, uh, I'll admit, I've never had my house broken into. Uh, hopefully, you guys haven't had your houses broken into. But my guess is that when somebody breaks into your house, it's not like a, a, a knock on the door and they like give you some time to wake up and like get dressed and kind of get ready. You know, come and answer the door, maybe have some coffee already prepared for whoever's at the door. Um, you know, and I'm guessing that it, 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 it's not like, you know, you open the door and they're like, hi, we're here to rob you. Is that okay? Like, would you be okay with us uh, coming in? That's, that's not typically what happens, right? Like, typically if somebody breaks in, uh, most likely your lock has been picked. Maybe the door's been kicked in. Maybe they broke a window. And they're in there when you don't expect them to be. Like, you probably don't have coffee going. You probably aren't, I don't know, baking cookies. Like, that's not what happens. And what Paul is trying to show is that Jesus is coming in the exact same manner. This is not something that we are meant to just kind of get ready for when the time comes. This is not like a Jesus has come, let's all get dressed, let's make sure that we're presentable, let's make sure that we are coffee going for Jesus. It's like Jesus is coming and there's not really a whole lot of preparation you can do on that day. It's something you prepare for ahead of time. And so, as we kind of depart from here, my encouragement and sort of my challenge is this, is are you prepared? If Jesus were to kind of come and, you know, get a breaking and entering charge like today, are you ready? Because my guess is that he's not coming in and, you know, breaking into like, do your dishes, you know, and like, Fold the laundry that's been on the couch for roughly three weeks. <laughs> for some of you, right? It's clean. Like, or at least it was three weeks ago when I put it on the couch. I'm not married, obviously. Because I'm sure that would not fly very well if the clothes have been on the couch for. Did I say three weeks? Three days. <laughs> so, thank you. Pray that I find one first. That's sort of a joke. Um, it's like partially serious, partially not. Um, so, Jesus is coming. He's coming quickly, and he's coming quietly. And it is on us to be ready. 
right? Like, I'm sure you guys have probably seen the ads for like ABT and like all these like home security things. Those are for the people who are prepared. Right. So there is a there is a trumpet sound, but you know what I mean. Like he's not giving us like a quick heads up. Um, it's just kind of happy. So um, if ADT helps to secure your home and get you ready for a break-in, when it comes to the time that we have now, our version of ADT is making sure that our souls are ready for Christ to return. Because one, we don't know the time or hour that Jesus is coming back. And two, we also don't know the time or hour in which we are going to pass away. <laughs> in both of those scenarios, the timing is not known. And so the only thing that we can do is with the time that we have now, we get prepared. Today we actually have uh, a baptism taking place. And so um, this is sort of one of those ways in which our souls get prepared, right? So we are told that those who are dead in Christ will rise with him. And those who are even alive in Christ will be reunited with him as well. And so with the time that we have now, it's important that our souls are prepared. That we have accepted Christ as our Lord and Savior. That we have been immersed into the body of believers. This sort of initiation into the body of Christ. And that we continue to be sanctified like we talked about last week. That we continue to grow in our faith until Christ's return. That way, just like with A.T., just like with locking the doors, we can be as prepared as possible for Christ's return before it's too late. Because when it comes to somebody breaking into my house, the only thing I can do is be as ready as possible before it happens. Because once it happens, there is no more preparation I can do. It's too late. It has already happened. And so... I will be down front. Mike is going to lead us, and, and the band is going to lead us. Are, they are going to lead us. We're going to this English before uh, next month. We're going to have to like crack open a little uh, English textbook or something. I don't know. I'm sure Brooke probably has one that I borrow. Um, as that happens, I will be down front, and if there is any kind of decision that needs to be made, uh, we will have time to uh, pray about that, talk about that, and make those decisions. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day that you've given us. God, I thank you for your Son who has paved the way for us to have hope. God, that we are not surprised or uninformed about your coming what that looks like. God, I pray that we would just understand that the only time that we have to truly make any decisions that need to be made, the only real time that we have is now. Now is really the only time that is sort of guaranteed. But we're not promised tomorrow. We're not promised to leave now. God, I pray that we would just encourage those who struggle with grief, struggle with loss, that we would remind them 